thank you for organizers. And uh, indeed, I will talk now about uh, uh, about tungsten and molybdenum disulfide transition metal dichalcogenide synthesis uh, when their structure or morphology changed from 2D to one dimensional. And about most pronounced properties uh, of these materials which occurred during this structural modification. So I will talk about this, give you some update on synthesis of nanotubes, a one dimensional tungsten and molybdenum disulfide, and about uh, bulk photovoltaic effect, cathode luminescence and the resistive effect. These three most interesting phenomena which were found um, in these materials uh, and do not present it in tungsten and molybdenum disulfide when these materials are um, the bulk shape, three-dimensional or two-dimensional. Um, so what is it tungsten and molybdenum disulfide? Uh, it is, um, Layered materials, first of all, and on this property, actually, uh, we based when creating new structures and new investigations. On this image, you can see transmission electron microscope um, uh, of bulk molybdenum disulfide. You can see here the black lines which parallel to each other, and in model, you can see actually it is layers of this material, while the atoms inside the layer fall together by strong covalent bonds and um, created so-called uh, layer. This layer different from carbon uh, graphene by this that we have here, three atomic layers creating one layer. And this makes this layer more rigid read it and of course influence uh, its behavior. So actually black, black line on this image it's molecular layer of um, molybdenum disulfide or tungsten disulfide looks the same. And white layers it could be associated with the gap between the layers which is actually exists due to the weak van der Waals forces which keep the which uh, <clears throat> keep these layers together. Moreover, the presence of these weak uh, chemical bonds allow this material to be flexible and to create so-called nanotubes. So actually, uh, you can see that uh, when we bend the layers into cylinders, uh, we create a nanotube. And we call them inorganic nanotubes because it is tungsten and molybdenum disulfide, not carbon. And we will use, I will use this abbreviation, INT for for inorganic and T4 nanotubes. Okay, please pay attention that when we create nanotubes, each layer has different diameter and different amount of molecules inside. So this makes these layers incommensurate, but create stable and very uh, good defined structure. <clears throat> so in transmission electron microscope, the image of these nanotubes looks like in this picture, you can see the whole core inside. And this picture could be created when electron beam um, radiate nanotube in the direction perpendicular to the nanotube, to the nanotube axis, such, uh, in such a way that electrons which passing the edges of the tube from two sides uh, create this layer image while the electrons which go in through the middle of the tube create some additional contrast in the, in the image because these uh, layers are perpendicular to the electrons and do not uh, create their structure. So what is important in this material is that when we create everywhere in these layers, the layers uh, or cylinders become uh, also spiral. In this case, uh, we actually result in stress uh, and loss of um, symmetry in the system. Uh, 
in this crystal. And this based on new properties to transition metal with alkalinates. I will show you a few slides about the synthesis and then we will switch to the properties. So first of all, uh, these materials were first discovered in 92-95 in a group of Professor Rishifin and Weizmann Institute of Science in Israel. And the first nanotubes were obtained um, as a product, as a reaction product, as a mixture of different size and different shape crystals. And here you can see also the very beautiful nanotubes. And it is almost like this. When you first time get some new material, it is mixed with different other shapes. But our task was to create this material and synthesize and define the conditions and to understand the growth mechanism in order to synthesize pure phase. And definitely it was done, but if you can pay attention from 92 to 2009, 17 years later, because the process is definitely not simple. So a number of papers were published still, still that time. But you can say definitely pure phase and 10, in, 10 <laughs> in 10 grams and of perfect crystalline nanotubes contained currently. Why we need this pure phase? Because when this material has only nanotubes and in a significant amount of grams, you can actually uh, help to yourself extensive study of their new properties. And definitely, I will show you at the end of my presentation, uh, maybe there are only a number of papers which were published still each time, but uh, studying their properties in different laboratories all over the world, where people use their expert laboratories from mechanical properties to uh, electro-optical properties in absolutely different uh, issues and applications, uh, this allow us so uh, this allows more than a uh, few hundreds, maybe papers, and all this due to the availability of this material. So the next step was to synthesize molybdenum with sulfide nanotubes. And it looks that it should be similar, but no. Um, although the calcium and molybdenum are very similar materials, their properties during their growth, Pretty different, and um, we succeeded to, to demonstrate uh, the first result only in 2020, uh, where we can get reproducibly and uh, a bit later on in pure phase molybdenum and disulfide nanotubes. Uh, in the beginning, we were of bigger diameter, big size distribution from 20 to 400 nanometers in diameters. It is a new. Uh, now you see picture with the uh, last um, our last results when the size distribution is much smaller from 20 to 120 nanometers, but definitely can reproducibly and get them in pure phase. However, we still have the one challenge to get them of perfectly crystalline structure because some of the tubes have definitely very beautiful parallel layers, and in some the nanotubes are grow random. Um, randomly, and we see distorted layers. So, um, and our purpose now to, to get all the nanotubes, like you see now on a few beautiful pictures, which we can obtain in now nanotubes. And why it is important? Because uh, most of the properties are influenced by the crystalline structure, because the mechanical strains. Is um, important for mechanical strength, the crystallinity is important. Of course, electrical and optical properties with, um, has to demonstrate some concrete and stable band gap also depends on crystallinity. So now we continue to work on this. But in the meantime, uh, I will show you how we synthesize and I will show you the properties which were put on calcium disulfide nanotubes, which are pretty good. A crystalline, a crystalline material. So how we go, I will do it quickly without going too much into the details, but you can see that the process is moved one, two, three, four. We start from micron material, we evaporate, we, uh, we uh, react with hydrogen for reduction. When the combination of these molecules in the vapor uh, 
um, uh, create in the reactor, they start to condense and grow um, suboxide whiskers. So you can see that we get molybdenum suboxides as a whisker, so which later on sulfidized into nanotube, where you add hydrogen sulfide gas. Sulfidization starts usually from the from the sephirs and they're going outside inside. Uh, well, while finally oxide is converted to sulfide and the last step on the reaction. You can see here molybdenum sulfide starting from molybdenum uh, oxide. You can see also um, the confirmation for this uh, growth mechanism obtained from electron microscopy images. This is how whiskers look like. Um, the next step when a few layers created in the first surface. Uh, uh, this is uh, the next step of the sulfurization. And finally, when all oxide is converted to sulfide, you can get uh, um, nanotube. So, uh, in this reaction, what was the problematic is the each step is obtained at different uh, temperatures and with different combination of gases. You can see that. Um, uh, uh, neutral nitrogen, um, reduced hydrogen, hydrogen sulfide, uh, and different temperatures from 500 to 800 um, were used in this synthesis. Okay, our last um, process um, is the, the formation of whiskers in separate uh, reaction process and then sulfurization. So um, it is also can be done. Okay, so let's talk a bit about the properties of these materials, and I will talk specifically on properties of tungsten disulfide nanotubes, which I already said have good and perfect, even perfect crystallinity. And the first uh, phenomenon is about photovoltaic effect. Uh, the, uh, the discovery of this effect in nanotubes was published uh, three years ago. And, uh, it is a very interesting work. And now we're going to explain to you, first of all, what is it about photovoltaic effect? And what's the difference compared to photovoltaic effect? So actually you are familiar with, uh, uh, photo, with uh, traditional photovoltaic effect, which is based on pin junction. So actually when we have the contact with two different uh, semiconductors, and the, in the contact of these materials, there is exchange of the charge and some small uh, electric field is created. When um, this contact uh, is radiated by light, the free carriers are created in both semiconductors and the um, existence of um, electrical field cause them to move and actually to create electric current. It is actually uh, a standard uh, tr traditional bulk photovoltaic effect, but for today we know the efficiency of the materials which are used for these devices for solar cells and so on are uh, hitting its theoretical limit. That means that we can for 25-30% of efficiency and that is why today the scientific community of this field looking for new effects and new materials. And one of such effects, it is bulk photovoltaic effect. What's the difference? First of all, the bulk photovoltaic effect does not require pin junction. So if you will look at this diagram, where three different light to both materials, carriers created in both of them. But in the case of bulk photovoltaic effect, the uh, electric field is intrinsic to material itself. No need to materials, no need contact. It has the specific material and it uh, has inside, uh, built inside uh, electric field. And that is exactly how nanotubes work. But before this, let's uh, explain uh, which materials are suitable for this and what actually should happen. When um, 
dark photovoltaic effect is um, uh, created, it actually can be obtained by two phenomena. The first phenomena is spontaneous polarization. And spontaneous polarization is known effect. It is a material which has photoelectric properties. In this case, the classic electrical field is created. When material has a spontaneous polarization, the electric field is created inside and result in drift current when free, uh, uh, free carriers created. But there is um, another effect. Why we need another effect? Because non bulk tungsten, not bulk tungsten um, diesel feed, not nanotubes are not ferroelectric. They can create spontaneous polarization. But there is another effect with scout berry connection, and this effect has quantum mechanic um, basis and the eight so called shift current. Actually, it's based on the changes in crystal structure, while local potential um, is created uh, based on quantum mechanic mechanism. So this effect was shown is appear in calcium disulfide nanotubes. So uh, which materials could be suitable for this uh, for this effect? Actually, it is specific. polarization light. So once more, nanotubes are suitable for this and it's not. And I want only to show you how, how this material used is its symmetry. If you will look on calcium diesel feed material, uh, monolayer, bilayer, well, let's start from bulk. Bulk has many layers. Uh, then we will look on layer, monolayer, and nanotubes itself. Actually, when we exfoliate the bulk material and leave for ourselves only two um, layers, uh, from bulk to two layers, the structure will be not changed because inversion symmetry of this crystal is between two layers, somewhere here. So, as if you have two layers, so you will have. Uh, inverse symmetry. And in this case, of course, there will be no bulk photovoltaic effect because, as we said, bulk photovoltaic effect exists only when we have no inverse symmetry. Okay, what can we do? We can continue to exfoliate. Let's leave only one layer. Of course, if we leave only one layer, there will be no inverse symmetry. The center will disappear. However, the layer itself has mirror planes and threefold rotation symmetries. And these residual symmetries actually allow us uh, to see about photovoltaic effect, but very limited only by a linearly polarized light. But if you take this layer and bend it into nanotube or into a cylinder, then actually we will break all this symmetry. And we will get uh, and we will uh, get the crystal without no symmetry at all. So no rotational symmetries, no mirror symmetry, no inversion symmetry. And in addition, we have here chiral geometry because the layers are bent like chiral sheet. And then uh, actually a bulk photovoltaic effect could be obtained inversely of light polarization. So actually we have symmetrical and zero crystal, which result in polar nanotubes. Uh, this result in very potential and intrinsic, intrinsic electromotive forces, which allow bulk photovoltaic effect. This is how it was measured. We used, uh, we used this device where you see the nanotube in between two electrodes. And short current circuit, uh, current, short current, current was measured versus position of the laser sport to evaluate bulk photovoltaic effect. Why it was important to have laser, uh, to have uh, to measure the current versus laser sport? Because if we uh, if we radiate the middle of the tube, 
we can definitely see uh, the strong current in the middle, the strong current correlated and uh, uh, resulted in the radiation of the nanotube of nanotube with no influence of contact. Actually, you can see here that the light current in the center of the device away from the contents is the evidence for the bulk photovoltaic effect. Why? Because if we irradiate the um, contents, we can create the current, but this current will be due to the conventional short key barrier photovoltaic photothermal effect. While creating uh, the current without radiating of photon, it is a pure proof for bulk photovoltaic effect. In addition, of course, uh, the B layer and the mono layer were measured in similar way. And you can see the B layer, which have, uh, in, which have inverse symmetry, have zero current in the middle of the, of the sample. Monolayer should have, as you remember, very small and limited bulk photovoltaic effect. And you definitely see that current here, very, very small, 0, 0, 0.05 and 17 nano, nano to say that we have few orders of magnitude larger current in the nanotube comparing to monolayer. Not only, if you look at this diagram, you see the current um, short circuit current density on the y-axis versus uh, laser power. And you can see here a measurement of bulk photovoltaic effect for different materials in comparison with nanotubes, which are presented here with red dots. And you can see, if you pay attention also to the scale is logarithmic, you will see that the um, performance of nanotubes few orders of magnitude larger than other materials. So I will skip here a few, a few details of these measurements. Uh, actually, we only can say that uh, um, for the best of our knowledge, it was the first observation of bulk photovoltaic effect in nanomaterials and the transition method we talked about with so, so excellent results. Okay. Uh, if you remember, I promised you to talk about also, um, yes, and I also want to remind you that this effect is not possible in bulk material. So by bending the layers into tube, we actually succeeded to get this new uh, phenomena, which actually says that nanotubes are very promising solar cells in the future. So another um, property which was measured is the um, cathode luminescence. And the uh, cathode luminescence was measured in multiple nanotubes compared with single wall nanotubes. Single wall nanotubes were obtained from tungsten disulfide by using uh, plasma irradiation of multiple nanotubes. You can see that we took our big nanotubes, radiate the plasma, and you see how small we call them daughter nanotubes. They were created on the surface on the big tube mother nanotube. So when you take these uh, small nanotubes of five, seven nanometer in diameter compared to big tube, it should be written, it's about um, uh, from 60 to 100 nanometer in, in diameter. We actually uh, uh, can collect this uh, single wall nanotubes and study their properties. But how to collect? They're so small, they're five, seven nanometer in diameter. So we developed specific technique. We took the grid, which is suitable for transmission electron microscope um, uh, sample preparation. But this is special grid, which is marked. We go with this grid to microscope and we found where we have the group of single wall nanotubes. Then uh, we take this grid to uh, scanning the microscope. We found exactly the place where these small tubes uh, are presented. And then we measure their cathode luminescence. And we saw uh, the interesting phenomenon. Actually, for the case of single wall nanotubes, we got the peak which corresponds to 625 nanometer wavelengths or 1.98 electron volt band gap. When you measure this effect on multiple nanotubes, 
we see that the position of the peak uh, have large uh, wave, uh, large uh, wavelength, 661 nanometer. So actually, this could be uh, converted to electron volt like 1.87 electron volts. So actually, single wall nanotubes have large band gap. We say that a single wall nanotubes band gap is blue shifted by 110 milli electron volt or 36 nanometer. So first of all, I want once more to remind that if you try to measure cathode luminescence in bulk material where the layers are parallel to each other, there will be no found uh, cathode, there will be not found uh, this phenomena and irradiation of light cathode luminescence. No peak will be found only when you create nanotubes. But what we saw, that there is kind of change when you use single wall or multi wall nanotubes. And of course, actually the band gap increases when the number of layers decreases from multi wall to single wall, the uh, band gap increases. It is actually quantum confinement phenomenon which was found in these materials in Z direction which is actually perpendicular to the, to the layers. Uh, it, it have to be. It have to be also. Um, uh, it have to be also emphasized that if you compare these band gaps uh, of nanotubes with bulk material, which can be measured in a different other way, uh, uh, we can see that bulk material is a bigger, um, a bigger band gap. So. Um, both single and multiple nanotubes are red shifted, which is very strange because we know when we take macro material and go to smaller, we used to get blue shift. We used to see quantum confinement, quantum confinement size effect. But it is not happening here because additional phenomena which happen here. Indeed, the size should uh, result in blue shift, but because we have the stress in our layers, it was um, uh, shown in the literature before and calculated theoretically that strain in the lens result in redshift. So actually we see here the combination of both phenomena. And um, due to the strain is pretty large, and the redshift should be very strong, the single and multiple nanotubes are redshifted compared to bulk, but they are very close to it uh, because the um, uh, quantum confinement uh, actually exists uh, as well. Okay, so this is the literature where um, redshift was uh, calculated and demonstrated in different materials. Actually, the, uh, this result uh, can give us uh, the pro uh, probability for um, band gap engineering uh, based on these materials by using different number of layers or different sizes. Um, okay. uh, maybe, uh, yes, as for, as for, I will not stop here because lack of time, but in the paper which I mentioned, you can actually find a very deep analysis of uh, how the band up of different tubes of different diameter, different amount of layers uh, depends uh, related to the quantum confinement and strain effect. You can see here the uh, axis for, uh, for band gap, you see that the bulk materials have large band gap compared to all other materials. And you can see that the strain is, for example, smaller diameter of tube, of course, will result in bigger strain compared to large diameter. And in this case, the red shift is bigger for single wall nanotubes as well as for multi wall nanotubes. When multi wall nanotubes have smaller external diameter, in any case, the strain is bigger. To bend uh, this rigid layer, which is shown here in the corner, to bend this rigid layer into smaller diameter actually requires more strain. The more strain, the more red shift compared to, to the bulk. 
Here you can see also the, how the strain uh, depends on, um, uh, on the crystal structure. So there is no strain in bulk material, multi wall of bigger and smaller diameter, and single wall. You can see the smaller nanotubes have larger strain. So we invite it to get interested in this figure for more detailed explanation of this scheme. Uh, this work was done, I have to emphasize, with Professor Alonso from University of Valladol. He, he did this uh, theoretical calculation, and Dr. Um, Volker Bruser from Leibniz Institute of Plasma Science. Um, he measure, he prepare, uh, he uses plasma for prepare single wall nanotubes. And here you see a number of papers uh, with reference as shown here on this diagram, because in order to create this diagram, we use the measurements and calculation done in our work and also in, in the works cited here below. Okay, so the last uh, thing that I want to show you is the electrical conduction <coughs> of individual nanotubes under tensile stress. This work was published uh, two years ago and done in collaboration with Professor Antonio Bartolomeo from University of Salerno. And I will show you this very briefly. So using two tips done of tungsten conductive tips, um, succeeded to catch the individual nanotube. Initially, uh, to take these nanotubes, it was possible only due to the van der Waals forces between the nanotube and the tube. But later on, uh, later on, um, using electron beaming radiation, uh, these contacts were strengthening. And you see that the presence of different uh, carbon SLs, um, materials in the atmosphere of a microscope, this result in formation of this kind of glue in the contact between nanotube and the tube. And allow us to measure, to strengthen these nanotubes by, um, by taking these tips uh, one from another. How it was done, you can see the different steps of the elongation. Here, the initial length 9 micron, 9 and a half, 9 and 10 micron, 10 microns, and 11 microns, and the final point, the nanotubes was broken showing that the contacts between were pretty strong. So by, um, by measuring, by, uh, by strengthening each step of this strengthening, the electric current would measure along this nanotube. And very interesting phenomena were observed. Actually, the, you can see on this diagram current versus voltage, where the in different uh, curves related to different elongation. This is the initial position of the tube, elongation by 3%, 6 and 12. And you can see the higher the elongation, the smaller the current. Of course, finally, you can calculate the resistivity and see the smaller current um, demonstrate the big resistivity. So you can see that the resistivity increased or current decreases when strain increases. The, uh, the increase was exponential, which means that the material very, uh, re, uh, very strongly, uh, that the electrical properties of these materials very strongly respond to strain. In this case, we can say that material could be used as piezo resistive sensor. So actually, uh, once more, this effect does not exist in the plain uh, crystal when the layers are parallel to each other, only when you create these nanotubes. So for summary, I only want to mention the different um, applications that these tubes can demonstrate and properties. So as I said, solar cells were already mentioned. There's a resistive effect and solar luminescence for band gap engineering. You already saw this. And it is due to the semiconductor property, asymmetrical structure, uh, polarized uh, properties, and uh, size and number of layers. But this material, due to its layer structure, could be used for hydrogen storage because hydrogen could be uh, introduced between the layers in the hollow core and in between the nanotubes. 
Uh, these nanotubes can strengthen in polymer and they show very good results in different polymers, improving their mechanical and also thermal properties, having good adhesion and dispersion inside polymers without using any functionalization. This material is good for catalytic reaction and for photodetectors. Uh, for hydrogen evolution reaction, for example, for thick, for thick defect transition, and so on. Here you see just part of the publication which could be related to these properties. And uh, I will not read once more the conclusions. I only want to thank my group uh, for getting all these results and uh, my collaborators. Um, Dr. Sahi Levni, Levni, Professor um, Ivasa, Yashura Ivasa, Dr. Eugene Tang, with them we did this um, um, solar cell and the shows about the protect effect, Antonio Bartolomeo for piezo resistivity, Dr. Bruiser and Alonso for single wall nanotubes, uh, Dr. Kaplan Achiri for cathode luminescence measurements, Ronit Popovic and Igor Igor for electron microscopy and thanks for my funds and thank you for your kind attention. I am finished. If somebody have a question, you can ask me now uh, before uh, our kind organizers will contact us. Hello. Hello. Yeah, Dr. Carr from Sierra Leone, right? Jalai University. Yes. Yeah, it's a one. It's a it's a wonderful presentation, but the that and um, the 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 straight line graph. I don't know if it was uh, the standard. The the one of the points on the the one that is is trend. That point is far away from that other one. But in the same graph, the smaller one is, is very closer. Did you do any other test to justify that that result is accurate? Did you mean on the resistive measurements? The, the, the straight line graph, the correlation graph. Um, is this one? Yeah, yeah, this one. This okay. One. So mm -hmm. what did you ask? Graph B, right? That's here. Graph B, you, you, yeah. You have straight in percentage. Then yeah. and on that on that graph, you have four points. What yeah. I have? The, yeah, I'm good afternoon. I'm coming. I'm coming. You have four points. So one point, the the one with the percentage. The if you can see from the graph, from oh, the origin, from the origin to the second point, they correlated. But the third point is far away from the from the uh, uh, line of best fit. Then you come like for the smaller one in the one with stretch, which is. In GPA, the resistivity from origin is, is very closer than the, this other one closer. Then the third one also is it's not far away. And the last point also is most accurate. You mean this last point for 12%? No, for the bigger one, the, 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 this point, the third point, the third point is away from the from the line of best fit. No, no, it is and, not. Away. It's, it's uh, actually very good. This thing. one is, you see, you see, and this one is not exact. This one also, the last one is down. But if you look at the smaller point, the smaller graph, which is 10 to the power one, minus one, sorry, on the y axis, on the x axis from zero to 21, the point is accurate. Uh, okay, because uh, uh, these are results which were obtained and um, we calculated also 
this resistivity was calculated from from the actually the measurements were done for for current versus voltage and resistivity was calculated and um, because the lack of time i'm not showing this calculation result but um, but you can definitely uh, interesting in this paper uh, and to, to try to understand this point which is not clear but um, actually it was calculated and the points uh, in our opinion is a pretty good correlated with line behavior which is if you pay attention for this uh, um, yeah, for this uh, logarithmic scale it actually means that uh, the change is exponential okay it's, it's okay it's okay mm -hmm. 